thank you all for, for joining, for registering and for joining the meeting. And I'd like for you all to please welcome Angelina Button and Sam Grubb of Adafio Technology Partners. Angeline is a senior cybersecurity consultant and trusted advisor of technology solutions specializing in threats from phishing, vishing, smishing, malware, ransom, and user error. Sam Grubb is a cybersecurity consultant who focuses on policy, security risk, assessments, and security awareness programs. I'd also like to thank Adafio for making these experts available to us and to thank our sponsor, Cox Business Solutions, for being our technology sponsor. And with that, I'm going to end our share. And Angeline, shall I make you co-host? Are you going to start or? Yes. Yeah. I'll, I'll go ahead and I'll follow him and handle the slides for both of us that way. Ah, perfect. All right. How does that work for you guys? You able Looks to good. That? Looks great. Good. All right. I'm gonna have to turn a little bit while we're doing it, but we'll, we'll, we'll get that working. All right, Sam, you go ahead and start. Yeah, um, thank you. Um, welcome uh, to our talk here um, with the Fayetteville Chamber of Commerce. Um, this talk is titled Cutting Cybersecurity, You Just Hacked Yourself, uh, Why Cybersecurity is Not a Good Area to Cut. Um, and we'll really be focusing on sort of uh, the reasonings behind having a cybersecurity program, even if you're a small or medium-sized business, uh, it's still really important uh, to have some of the cybersecurity things in place. Uh, you don't need, you know, all the bells and whistles of a company like a Walmart or something like that, but there are definitely things that you can do. So we'll get into that. Go ahead, Angel. So a little bit, if you um, don't know us, um, we're Adafio Technology Partners. Um, we are a what we call a managed service provider. So we provide um, IT services um, from cloud solutions to full IT management, uh, security, and all sorts of stuff in between. So we have um, consulting firms. We have um, uh, offices in uh, North Little Rock, Conway, and Rogers. Um, we've been one of the leading IT providers in consulting firms um, since 1999. Got a whole ton of recognition, recognition a lot of long-term partnerships um, with over 200 uh, mid to enterprise level clients, um, healthcare, financial, retail, transportation, you, you name it, we do it. Uh, and really the big thing is, is what we call the Adafio difference. And that's uh, where we really focus on client success um, we have uh, core values that we follow, unquestionable uh, integrity, committed to client success, and working as one team uh, with humility and respect. And we all follow those core values in order to provide, um, you know, that real people power uh, for our clients. So my name is Sam Grubb, and, and as was said, I um, am a, a cybersecurity consultant. Um, I recently just moved up to the Northwest Arkansas area uh, to help support clients up here. Uh, I live in uh, Centerton. Uh, you've got your files. Up. I moved up. <laughs> Sorry about that. There. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> um, so I previously worked as a contractor for the National Guard and uh, at Jacksonville High School in Jacksonville, Arkansas, uh, teaching uh, cybersecurity. Um, and so now really I'm working on a lot of different things. Um, one of the things is uh, CMMC uh, compliance uh, as well as, uh, uh, that's a, a DOD compliance standard, uh, as well as security awareness programs. Um, and I, you know, I'm enjoying spending time with my uh, wife and kid. Um, you have a, another. I did it again. Sorry. Yeah. It's okay. There we go. There we go. This is the life of dual monitors. Um, we all we all fight them. You yeah, can go ahead and move on. Three. To, yeah. 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 Three. Yeah. There we go. Um, hi, I'm Angeline Button, uh, senior cybersecurity consultant. Uh, I, they kind of already have gone through the rundown, a uh, little bio that we have. Uh, what's not listed or discussed on here is I am a new grandmother as of two months ago. So I'm very excited. I get to spend a lot of time with my grandchild. So I decided to throw that in there. 
We're going to go ahead and discuss, uh, these are the different topics. We're going to talk about whack-a-mole security. Um, the idea of that is the beginning of, of your cybersecurity journey and how you can mature that as a small or medium-sized business. We're going to discuss, we, I think you've heard like two-factor authentication, 2FA, it's MFA, multi-factor authentication is all kind of the same topic. So we're going to go over that. Uh, email hygiene. Uh, macros and how macros are one of the most used, I think it's like in the 90s, we'll, we'll go over that quote, uh, one of the most used for malware and how you could disable it uh, um, permanently if you don't need it for your environment or whitelist the people that would need that. Uh, we're going to talk about how to own your own cybersecurity for your company. We're going to go over some security awareness. Um, uh, why security awareness is so important for your organization, as well as why do you need cybersecurity insurance? You already have insurance for the business. What does cybersecurity insurance give for you? So let's go ahead and start with clicking all over the place here. So in 2019, it's called the DBIR report. It's a Verizon report. It came out with a finding that 40 3% of the breaches are involved uh, in small businesses. And then out of all of it, the largest percent of victims now are coming from small, medium-sized businesses. Uh, the, this is due to uh, the larger businesses and organizations have now put a lot of time and effort into creating security layers, making it more difficult for actors or attackers to breach their organization, so now they're working more towards attacking uh, small and medium-sized businesses because there's, those controls aren't in place as much as with the other ones. So we're gonna come with what's called cyber whack-a-mole. So this is the idea of you have an instance like ransomware happens for your organization and then you handle it. Uh, you have a SQL injection on your website that's a problem you handle it. So it's the idea of reacting after an event already happens. So CEO fraud is the idea of um, an email, you get a phishing email, someone in your company does, uh, pretending to be the owner or the CEO of the company and asking for a wire transfer set up. Go ahead and pay by wire transfer. So that's the idea of CEO fraud. So you handle it after the event. The same with account compromises. That's such like um, you use your email address for more than just uh, or your email address, your email credentials for more than just like 365. You might be also using it for like a LinkedIn account or um, MyFitnessPal. And then one of those get breached with the credentials and then they go through, what actors and attackers go through is all of the places that you might reuse your credentials and attempt to get in. And then they can compromise your account. So once that happens, you're going, okay, all of a sudden Microsoft's saying you can't send email from your account anymore because it's been compromised. It appears to be compromised. And then you're reacting to that and you're hiring um, even a DAFIO to come in and take a look at that and kind of resolve the problem. So this is the idea of let's take a, a react, just reactive where we're just handling it that way. And let's look at um, moving more towards, uh, I'm in the wrong direction there. Hold on. Proactive and reactive. So what that does is reactive is like your password resets after you've had your email compromised. Reactive is blocking IPs. So the idea of blocking IPs is on your network, you're having um, a DDoS activity happening where they're, they're hitting your network really hard and slowing you down so that you can't work. Um, that would be actors or, or um, attackers. And so what you do is start blocking the IPs that are the location based of where the traffic's coming from. And then there's also incident response, which is after your account's been compromised, you have to check and see what kind of um, data they might have had access to or what they did to your account while they had access to it. So if you have 365, there's also your SharePoint files and all of that data as well that they potentially had access to. And then monitoring and alerting is also considered reactive. So that's the idea of, so your firewall will alert you to specific traffic that is bad, or let's say you get an email filtering that's handling and, and alerting you that malware is um, being attempted to be delivered into your environment, or you get a centralized logging tool and then you have a SIM or SOC as a service. This monitoring that for you, or you have a SOC yourself, this monitoring and alerting on specific malicious behavior. That's considered reactive. 
what proactive is is risk management so you come in somebody comes in or, or you sit and form a, a committee to start going over what risks do we have within our environment and um, what are considered critical assets what risks are we willing to um, what risk can we mitigate what risks um, can't we mitigate so what controls can we put in place while we're working towards a final solution for that so for example if you have a patching schedule for your environment and that's another one uh, patching would be part of that uh, uh, proactive work that you would do is that you're only running it once a month and something comes out is critical but you can't roll out that patch uh, roll out for another week, what are you going to do for your control? What controls are you going to put in place for anything that's critical and already being exploited in the wild? So are you going to, you know, temporarily do some blocking in the firewall or some kind of um, information like that? And then that kind of rolls into your vulnerability management where, you know, we're getting the patches, you're running the patches, then you're running scans on your environment, determining what kind of vulnerabilities do you even have in your environment, externally facing and internal to your environment. And security awareness is the idea of there's like no before is a good example we use them to go ahead and do like emails pretending to be um, from an actor or and they're malicious but they're not really malicious and it's a campaign to get you to get users to if they click the link or if they download the malware it notifies them that it was actually would have been considered malicious and why and then you go through like a little training on how you can watch for that in the future. So security awareness is a really important part of being proactive. D disk encryption and protection, disaster recovery plan, and like we're gonna talk about is that two-factor authentication or multi-factor authentication as well. So what proactive steps can you take today? We're going to say this for every single webinar we do <clears throat> and talk in every client that we talk to. Uh, this came from Microsoft, so you are 99.9% .9 less likely to be compromised if you have enabled MFA or two-factor authentication or multi-factor authentication, whatever you want to call it, to ensure your account or uh, on all of your accounts. And that's not just your email account, that's anything externally facing. So that could be your email, if you're VPNing in, that would be the VPN. Um, Anything that you're logging into, like if you're healthcare, I think it's EMR solution, EHR solution as well. So anything where you're external, and I would say everything personal you should do as well. If they offer that two-factor authentication, like LinkedIn does, um, actually all of them, Facebook does, you can go through and set that up and, and have that additional layer of security. Um, we'd be more than willing to help you. We've got some blogs that we've written and resources on how to help you on a personal level to set that up as well that we'll share with you if you're interested after the, the webinar. So very important statistic. So what is two-factor fa two or um, MFA? So what MFA does, and this picture kind of is a perfect way of showing it, you have the idea where you're putting in your credentials, so your email address for the most part and your password. You hit enter, a form of proof still has to be done. So whether, I'm sure you guys have run across this a few times, whether a text goes to your mobile phone or if you have an app like Duo, um, Google Authenticator is another one, Authy, and you can go ahead and <clears throat> click on yes, that's me, you can continue, or a code shows up and you have to enter a code into the site. But there's different ways you can go about it. And then that gives you that access. So it's the idea of you have something we know, something we have, and something we are. And that's how we're working towards that additional layer of multi-factor authentication. And by the way, if you guys have any questions, feel free to ask during this, or you can add it to comments and we can talk about it at the end of the presentation. Okay, so let me get on to the next. So over 90% of data breaches start with a phishing email. So well, there's so many different ways that um, your organization can be breached, but it is really important to note that 90% are coming from phishing. So if we can figure out a way to help your organization to be more um, cognizant of the email that's coming in and very careful before they click on a link, before you download malware, um, then that's your win right there. So security awareness and um, MFA. So if you get those two in place, working towards that. So it, 
I had written also email hygiene, which we're going to talk about a little bit. That also is um, very helpful. So if it does get through and uh, your credentials are compromised or your uh, some of your employees' credentials are compromised, um, we want to make sure that the data they have access to is limited and we're not storing years worth of data in your email account or SharePoint files or folders accessing things from 10 years ago. So there's that idea of email hygiene and, and data retention policies, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. Right now, actually. <laughs> so email hygiene. What data would be available if one of your organization's employees' email accounts were compromised? So that's kind of what we're talking about. So somebody, an actor, gets your credentials, we'll say it's yours, and compromises it. And then they go and they log in to your 365 account because you don't have MFA in place enabled at this time. So once they're in, they have access to all of the data in all of your folders, including, if this is 365, including your deleted items, and you're purged unless you have a data retention policy in place that says after a week or something, we're gonna take the purged items and make it permanently deleted. So your deleted items are going to also continue to stay there unless you set up a policy that says, like for example, after 30 days, anything in deleted items is going to go to purge, and then you have that policy in purge and that seven days will be deleted. So what happens is people's deleted items folders in 365 get bigger and bigger and bigger, and they're just not aware of the fact that it delete, doesn't delete it permanently, or they start kind of using that as a storage location, which is fine unless you're compromised. So then they can start collecting all of those emails to use to compromise all of the people that you, you talk to on a regular basis, such as vendors, other customers. They can reply off of those emails and start sending malware uh, or um, credential, trying to get your credentials or, the, or their credentials. So it's the idea of clean up your email, that set up a policy that works for you based on the compliance that you have. Um, if you're healthcare, there might be different compliance requirements of how long you retain the data versus others. But you can also look into the idea of retaining the data, but it's not accessible by you. So once you've deleted it and purged it, you can set it up so it goes into another kind of audit function where it's still holding that data for your compliance for your compliance time, let's say it's a year or two, but it's not available for you once you've logged into that account. Also, it's important to pay attention to links. How long are you allowing links in 365 to stay active, especially if it's going to um, confidential or PII or possibly PHI information. Uh, you also want to look at any rules that you have in place and that we, what we um, recommend you looking at rules on a regular basis. I would say like if you set up a reminder, especially if you don't have MFA in place, a lot of times when actors compromise your account, they go in, they create a rule to forward the emails with keywords to another folder that they're monitoring. And you're not even aware that that's happening, that, that you're even compromised. So additionally, um, look at your signature on a regular basis. We've seen actors change the phone number by one digit so that the number of the phone calls are going to them versus to you. Uh, the same with the email address and the signature. <clears throat> so these are some of the some of the steps that you can take to start working on your hygiene. And with Gmail, uh, <clears throat> sorry about that, the deleted is every 30 days. That's an automatic um, cleanup that it's doing, but it, it's the same thing applies. You have G Suite, uh, so you have all your documents are available. The same type of uh, issue lies there that if you're not cleaning up your um, inbox or all of your different folders on a regular basis, you will still have the same issue, okay? And then Sam. Good to you. So additionally, there's a bunch of uh, different stuff that uh, you can do that is um, uh, things that you need to be aware of even in uh, your own environment that are just sort of one-off things you can do. So routinely patching and updating your systems, changing default credentials, um, antivirus, um, making sure that's on uh, all of your devices, um, especially your legacy devices, if you have some older systems, um, making sure that antivirus is as up-to-date as it can be. Um, if you do have legacy systems, upgrading those systems. 
um, routinely running vulnerability scans on externally facing systems, but also internally, and then making sure you have good password uh, policy, good password procedures. So, uh, you know, using passphrases like the ones that we have here, uh, at least 12 characters, Putting a symbol and numbers in there is always good. Um, never use the same password twice. Uh, create and store those passwords using a password manager. Uh, this is not a official Adafio recommendation, but I really like to use uh, LastPass for my personal passwords. So that's uh, one of the password managers that you could use. Um, the thing about passwords too is that you want to remember, and I, we, we sort of touched on this with email hygiene, but if you're going to use... Um, a personal email to create an account, don't use that same password for a work email. Um, and don't use your work email to create personal accounts. Uh, it's just gonna lead to a lot more threats, a lot more possibility that you're gonna be compromised. Uh, and the last thing is if you don't need them, you need to disable Microsoft macros. Um, so let's kind of talk about that a little bit. Go ahead, next slide. So that Verizon data breach uh, report, it found that 90% of emailed malware is distributed via macros. Uh, so what is a macro? Well, a macro is sort of a, a script or a additional language that is added to a document uh, in order to enhance how that document works. Um, so it, it does a lot of things um, depending on what type of document you're using. Um, you know, you can have macros that create certain templates in Word. Um, you can have macros that run certain formulas or calculations inside Excel. Uh, they're really common in Excel documents, but they are can be used in uh, pretty much any of the Office uh, uh, programs. So the problem with macros is that it is really easy for a user to accidentally enable a script that is running malicious code. And, and once the macro is enabled, it just runs it. Uh, and so there's all sorts of things that a, um, a black hat or, or a bad actor can do, um, you know, uh, providing malware, um, putting Trojan horses, deleting documents, destroying documents, all sorts of things. So um, what you want to do is make sure that you're not enabling the macro macro macros by default, and then only enable macros from trusted senders. We see here that we have a little picture where it says security warning, um, some active content has been disabled. You don't want to just automatically click enable content uh, unless you really are sure you know um, where this document came from. You've verified that it is authentic. Um, but even then, you do want to be careful because people do get their emails hacked. Um, and one of the ways that we see these sort of phishing campaigns work is they'll hack one email and then they'll send out documents that look legitimate to all the contacts in that email's uh, contact list. And so because it's coming from someone they've talked to before, um, they see this document, they're really, they're not sure why they're getting an Excel document from this person, but they want to, uh, you know, uh, look at it, see what it's about. Um, and then the hack, the hacker will often put things like, Oh, you need to enable the macros to see this document. They'll, they'll write that in the document just to give that added bonus of please, please enable the macro. And, um, people do, and then they get malware. So, um, you really just want to make sure that you're, uh, only, enabling macros if you know that this is something you have to do you've verified that the sender sent you a document with macros uh, and that sort of thing so you've learned all about this cybersecurity stuff you've learned about the things that you can do but what you're really wondering is, well, how can I maximize my cybersecurity investment? And this is really true because when it comes to a small, medium business, you don't have an unlimited budget, right? You don't have a Walmart-sized budget where they can, um, you know, buy their own forensics department and, and security teams and all this equipment and stuff like that. So you really need to know how can you get cybersecurity um, maximized with the investments that you're making so that when you buy a product, it's going to do the most for you. So go ahead. So the big thing is just owning your security. And the way that you do that is you create a culture of cybersecurity awareness. And that requires a lot of time, um, not necessarily money, but a lot of time, especially time with your upper level um, uh, CEOs and executives. You have to have 
a council or a steering committee um, that includes a bunch of uh, different business units. And you're going to collaborate amongst these units uh, in order to decide how best to deal with your security. What risks do you have? Um, what threats are out there for your organization? And then what are your goals as a business and how does security align with those goals? Um, the reason you want all different business units, you don't want just technical people in there is because people view security all different ways. And you need somebody who is technical, yes, but you also need people who are going to have a insight into how these solutions, how these technical solutions will affect the business, um, how they should be implemented, and how to get people to adhere to them. Um, so you want to change the view from this is happening. Um, you know, we're, we're getting hacked. We're getting spam emails. We're getting phishing attempts. We don't know what to do about it to this is what we can do about it. This is how we can fix it. This is what our goals are going to be. And this steering committee can really um, work together to establish a three to five year security plan. Um, and that's really what goals do you have uh, for your security. So you want to implement a security awareness program by next year, right? And you're going to talk and work uh, with your steering committee to determine what's the best way to do this. How can we maximize the investment in this? How can we make sure the program's going to work for our employees and give them what they need um, and accomplish that goal? And then move on to your next goal. We need to update all of our systems by then because we know they're going to be out of date. So let's work on uh, figuring out the budget for this and making sure that we're, we're updating these on time. Go ahead. Uh, so this is, this is a little uh, joke that we have here. Uh, you know, our users often are um, seen as an Achilles heel um, because the user is the one who is going to be answering these phishing emails, clicking these links, enabling these macros. But the way that I like to think about it and the way that we think about it in Adafio is that it's not so much that it's the user's fault. Um, it is the, the user just isn't aware. They haven't been trained. And you think about somebody who is cooking a souffle for the first time. And if that souffle deflated, you wouldn't yell at the person or get mad at them or, or say, oh, you're a terrible chef. Well, they've, they've never cooked a souffle before, right? They may not know all the intricacies that they um, are required to make sure that souffle comes out good. And it's the same thing with security awareness. If you've never seen a phishing email, um, if you've never heard the, the word macro before, then how are you going to know what can be done with a macro? How are you going to know how to um, verify that the user uh, or the the sender of the email is legitimate. You're not. So you need to have security awareness in order to create a human firewall. Uh, train your people in what they need to do to be part of the security that is your entire organization. So you're going to look at things, you know, like your um, regulatory frameworks, PCI, HIPAA, Sorbanes-Oxley, NIST, these sorts of things require that you have this training in place. 94% um, of SMBs detected malware received by email. That includes ransomware. 90% uh, of attempts are done by phishing. So what the security awareness program is going to do is it's going to train your users to find these phishing attempts, um, to recognize when a file um, may look like malware. Um, it's going to train them to recognize these social engineering red, red flags, um, you know, things like, where did this come from? Has this person ever sent something to me before? Um, checking that friendly name um, versus where the actual email came from. Um, why is this email being sent at 3 a.m.? Um, why is my CEO asking me to buy gift cards? They never ask me to buy gift cards. That's, that's a big one right there. Um, and I know a lot of us would think that the CEO is, is a real going to buy us gift cards and we're going to get a bunch of um, awesome stuff, especially COVID bonuses. But really, let's think about the likelihood of that happening, right? Um, that's, that's a little bit of a joke. But still, we want to look at these sorts of weird things that are going on and um, take a second to say, you know, I think I better run this past somebody who is a security person, somebody I can trust, um, or just even another coworker to see, hey, do you think this is weird? Go ahead. So the other thing that you can do besides, you know, starting the security steering committee, um, doing that security training is think about cybersecurity insurance. Uh, and when it comes to cybersecurity insurance, you can move to the next slide. 
we had a 424% increase in new small business cyber breaches. So we do all this stuff to prevent attacks. We try to be proactive, but you have to think about what happens if. What happens if I do have a breach? What happens if um, I do or I am attacked and um, I need to deal with the consequences of this? The big thing is you can't ignore it. You, you got to do some remediation. You got to figure out what happened and all of that is going to be expensive. So the benefit of um, uh, cybersecurity insurance is that it's going to cover a lot of things that conventional business insurance policies like general liability, crime, professional liability, they don't cover everything. So there, there may be some degree of protection. Um, that's something that you would have to talk to with your insurance provider or your underwriter. Um, we do not provide any recommendations on cybersecurity insurance other than it's a thing that you should investigate. Um, but, you know, these sorts of things... Um, are, are important because cybersecurity insurance is going to cover more than a typical policy. Um, and it's going to uh, look at things like how much is it going to cost to do this inv IR investigation, notifications, um, uh, if there's a privacy breach, um, uh, you know, fines, these sorts of things. It, it just depends on the policy. Uh, we have to remember 60% of small businesses that are victims of cyber attacks go out of business within six months. We had a recent example of this here in Arkansas, in central Arkansas, um, with the Heritage Company, uh, a telemarketing company that had a ransomware attack and was uh, in October of 2019 and was out of business by January. So, you know, these are very real things that can happen. And you start looking at the costs for a data breach. I mean, you're talking 50,000 for a data breach coast, crisis management of 40,000, notifications, 10,000, fines, 530,000, forensics, call centers. I mean, there's all sorts of things. So your policy should cover things like forensics costs, um, getting a incident response team, to investigate and see what sort of data was breached. Um, credit monitoring, if you, if you lost credit cards or, or some sort of sensitive customer data, um, notification expenses, extortion costs. Um, there are insurance policies that will pay ransomware extortion um, potentially. So it, it really just depends on the policy. Um, the best thing you can do right now is just start asking questions. You know, uh, talk to your insurance provider, talk to um, your underwriter, whoever it is where you, that you get your insurance from and say, hey, you know, we're interested in cybersecurity insurance. What is this going to cost us? What does it cover? And really look into that policy because there's no standard. Um, there's not a set, this is what you get and, that, and this is the standard across there. It really depends on what's in the policy, how it's written. Um, and so you really do need to investigate and, and ask questions to make sure you're getting the best for what your company needs. We also found a data breach calculator that we can share with you guys afterwards as well. If you want to go ahead and run an estimate, it's not from us, it's from another source we found. Awesome. So, uh, as I said, you know, reshop annually. Um, this is something that has been uh, around for, a, uh, I, well, I don't know how many years, but it, it's something that has gained a lot of momentum in the last couple of years. So, um, a lot of people are still sort of working through their policies, changing their policies. Um, they widely vary by um, a carrier. So, reshop often, ask questions, um, and then. Um, uh, insurance applications should have all their stuff documented outside the application. Awesome. So I think that finishes uh, up. So if um, we have any questions from the audience, we'd be uh, happy to take those right now. Oh, yeah. That has to be wiped, by the way, from the recording. Sorry about that. <laughs> like immediately <laughs> yes <laughs> let's see we got a question here um eve were you able to see the slides in the end i had a question that you couldn't see them is eve still here all right I'll, what I'll do is we can send her this, the slides afterwards too. I have her information, so if needed. All right. Any other questions at all, you guys?
There are no silly questions at, at all. So I, I've got a, a, a question. Um, and apologies in advance if, if you don't know the answer, or you probably have an idea. In, in terms of data breaches for small businesses, if a business has a DOD contract and experiences a data breach, how impactful is that to your viability of maintaining that contract or getting another contract with the Department of Defense? For those of you who don't know, DOD is Department of Defense. So um, right now, so uh, let me answer that question with a with a another sort of a little mini statement, and then I'll, I'll rope, rope back and answer your question. So the big thing with Department of Defense right now and Department of Defense contractors is is uh, something called CMMC. Um, and if you're a Department of Defense contractor and you hear the letter C M M C and don't know what I'm talking about, please reach out to Adafio um, because this is a really big deal. And and if you if you don't know what I'm talking about, you definitely we can sit down and at least enlighten you on uh, on what's being required. Um, so this is a new um, sort of requirement for cybersecurity for DoD contractors. Um, it it's required by all DOD contractors. And within that, one of the requirements is that if you have a breach, you have to notify the DOD about the breach. And it does affect your ability to be audited next year um, for your CMMC. And you may not be audited at a level required for the contract. So there are different levels within the CMMC um, uh, framework and your contract may require, let's say a level three. Um, and that data breach may affect your ability to get to that level um, depending on what happened and, and what's what you've remediated and these sorts of things. So it's not a guarantee that you'll just lose contracts and that sort of stuff. That depends on the contract as well, um, depending on what level of contract it is, um, you know, if uh, the classification requirements and then what happened in the actual breach itself. But this is all stuff you're going to have to pay for. You're going to have to pay for investigations. You're going to have to pay for reports that you're going to send to the DOD. Um, there may be fines that the DOD levels against you um, for negligence um, and all of that stuff. That's all going to be leveled even if you're a small business. And these fines can get pretty hefty um, depending Depending on the level of negligence and um, and the the level of breach, so um, to, to answer your question, it's it is really important um, when it comes to uh, um, small businesses w working with DoD um, that they are aware of of the fact that there are stringent cybersecurity requirements and they're only getting more stringent. Uh, the, uh, uh, Go ahead. A, a follow up to that: a lot of companies. In my work with another, with, with my previous employer, there are a surprising number of, of employee employers companies in Arkansas that do have DoD contracts directly or indirectly, especially indirectly. There is a subcontractor to another company that has a DoD contract, and all of the requirements flow down through the entire subcontracted uh, uh, kind of arrangement. And a lot of the smaller companies that or a subcontractor to a DOD contract holder don't realize that they are held to that same level of scrutiny and, and requirements. Absolutely, absolutely. And, uh, and that's really important too, is that CMMC flows down as well. Um, so any contractor, subcontractor, suppliers even, um, will have to follow certain CMMC requirements. Now they may not be as stringent as the main contractor, um, but they can be um, particularly stringent. And there's some stuff in there that I, I guarantee you, um, some of these small businesses are not doing. Um, and, it, and it's not a necessarily negligence on their part. It's just they've never had to do it before. It's not been necessary. And it's not necessarily something that if we were just looking at them from a strictly business standpoint, we would recommend. But because of this compliance, they got to do it. Um, so, you know, one of the things that, that is really great with us here at Adafio is that when we do this sort of consulting, we really try to find the ability to uh, create solutions and meet compliance standards uh, that work for the business itself. You know, we're not going to suggest something that is outlandish or say, oh, well, you got to have this expensive piece. We're going to figure out how to do it in the budget and in the resources um, so that you meet those requirements while, you know, not breaking the bank. Angel, I apologize. I, I interrupted you. Go ahead. I'm just going to read off some questions that we had. So there's a question here. Any suggestions on determining how much cyber insurance is needed? So my recommendation on that would be um, 
first you want to talk with your insurance, uh, obviously, but also why don't you, you can reach out to Adafio and this is a non-charge and we can kind of, we have some people that are knowledgeable that could kind of steer you in a direction uh, towards a, a good cyber insurance. There's like wording, like I re was reading about duty to defend is something you want to look for within the policy when you're um, setting it up, but we, they can kind of guide you towards a, a good plan and what would work for you depending on the size of the company the, or organization that you are. Um, you know, what kind of compliance do you have in place? Is there PII, PHI, all of that kind of information kind of plays into it. I hope that answered your question. Is there any other questions? I had a couple people ask for copies of the presentation, um, this, the slide deck, so we'll go ahead and get that PDF to you, as well as some of the links we were talking about that we'd share with you. I think we did this last time as well. We'll get those same resource set off to you. Um, and then of course, they're working on the recording, which is, we'll just make sure that one part's not in there. So. <laughs> yes, we'll, we'll try to edit that out. <laughs> Again, uh, my, my thanks to Adafio for spending some time with us, and uh, thank you uh, uh, both uh, Sam and Ange Angel. Sorry, I keep wanting to call you Angeline. Uh, so we do have one more question in the chat. Uh, any pointers on training for employees for meeting the compliance mandate? Bonnie, I want to take that real quick. Before we end it. That he does a lot with our SAP program, so. Yeah. Because um, I'm thinking security awareness. She's yeah. About HIPAA. Yeah, so um, a security awareness program um, like the one that we run at Adafio is going to typically include um, compliance training like HIPAA um, required training um, or any of the other compliance training that you do. Um, the real big thing is you want to have training that is going to be relevant to what your users see. Um, so uh, Angel talked about it in your or in uh, her talk where she was saying we use a platform called Noble for and um, that platform provides phishing tests. Um, some of these are, are, I like to say, fresh out of the oven, um, literally stuff that they found last week or this week that people have reported and they modify it and send it right out. So it is stuff that is real, um, stuff that employees will see in their real life. Um, and uh, that is really important because you, you don't want to give them something that they're never going to deal with or never, never is useful for them. Um, and, but as far as compliance mandates go, you, it really just depends on the compliance. Um, but uh, typically it is a annual training um, with additional security training quarterly or monthly. Did that answer your questions? that you had about that or was it, did you want to, uh, do you have other questions you wanted to ask in reference to that if we didn't cover it? Hello. I'll just add my question and then to that. So as pointers for training for employees for meeting the compliance mandates, these, the, the canvas or the, or the, or the, or the structure of uh, these kind of mandates are fluid in nature. So they come up as, as you were saying, as we were having, like, they are going to change as they go. As Sam was saying, they are changing today, improving tomorrow, and then making a little training setup for it later. But my question was, uh, how do you incorporate that to, um, uh, to be met by employees who are going to have a need for more than just being a periodical training? It would be much more like fluid as an ongoing process of as incorporating it into the, uh, into the, into the, into the general stream of actually uh, doing a, a, a compliance job or if you're, if, you're, if you're going to train an annual might be good if you are, if you are having an unchanging mandate. But if it's more fluid, it would be more, much more incorporated as saying like um, you have a, okay, we have a 30 minute training session today. So to look at the updates on this or have a little um, scrum session or do a little session for updating those uh, kind of um, <clears throat> awareness programs. So is there something that would be structured in such a way that it's fluid by definition so that it can be an, as a continuous improvement process? Because most often cybersecurity is all about being continuously improvising as the industry changes. So the compliance might be met. So any ideas on that? That was my addendum to the question. So. Yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Um, and, you know, we're honestly, 
Um, the, uh, the thing that I want to tell you is that, uh, you need Adafio security awareness program. Um, and I'm not trying to, to do that just because I'm trying to, you know, uh, promote Adafio. I honestly think that's what you're looking for. So what we do with our security awareness program is, um, it is a month to month program where you get to meet with a consultant to talk about those changes, um, and to change how you're doing some of that training in order to meet those requirements. Um, we also do four quarterly trainings. So um, every, uh, you know, three months, you're getting a new chance to have um, actual training, um, as well as one annual in house training. So we're going to be able to meet that flexibility um, to meet those requirements to change how we're doing stuff. And then we're going to you're going to have that consultant who can actually bounce ideas off of and talk about, well, we don't really like this. Can we do this and, and get that um, expert feedback as well. Um, so I've done things with clients where I've um, one of the things actually was to meet CMMC requirements. So I used uh, our security awareness program uh, to give specific CEO, um, HR, uh, and uh, IT personnel training so that they would be trained in their specific area to meet that CMMC requirement that had just popped up. Uh, and it was seamless. It was easy, uh, you know, and now they've checked off that part of the requirement and they didn't have to worry about it at all. Um, so I, I really do, you know, think that a program like ours um, or a program uh, that is offered that's similar where you're going to get that um, ability to have feedback and have an expert work with you is important rather than something, as you said, that's static, that you're, you're getting a training library, but you don't know if it's updated or, or what's going to be best or what you need to pick and that sort of thing. That's a really good, uh, that's a good call out. Um, also, Larry, I had a great question. I'm going to admit I went and researched that a little bit during that conversation about the Fair and Accurate Credit Transaction Act. Is it still in place? And you're talking about the red flag rules. So I did see articles from May 17th, 2020, still discussing it as, as an, um, is still discussing it as being valid. Uh, so that is something we would have to research a little bit more if you wanted to have continued conversations, but it's something we could help with if there was an interest, Adopio, absolutely. Uh, if there was something in particular that you wanted to know about it, we could research that and get back to you as well. So if you wanted, Larry, you can hit us up with more details on that and uh, we can help you out with it. But that was really interesting read, thanks. <laughs> I'm going to make y'all read it. I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> 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 but I was really interested in what uh, that, that act did for uh, uh, identity theft. So mm -hmm. that was interesting. Did that help at all, Larry? I, I don't know if you were looking, like we can get that answer to you for sure. But if you had more specific questions, just let us know. Right. Anybody else? All right. Well, we'll get the slide deck out. Oh, I'm sorry. Was I interrupting somebody? No, no, I don't think so. Um, oh, uh, Larry answered yes. It, it, thank you. Perfect. Great. We'll follow again, up. Again, thank you, everybody, for joining. Uh, also, uh, thank you, Adafio, for allowing your experts to spend an hour of their time with us. Uh, thanks for the slides. I'll get that out. I'll get a link to uh, this uh, recording on our YouTube channel just as soon as we get it posted. And uh, as always, I would like to thank our technology sponsor, Cox Business Solutions, for sponsoring our technology. Um, with that, I'm going to make sure that last chat yeah, was just a great. Thank you. Well, do we didn't want to miss a question. Again, thank you all. You have a great day, and I look forward to uh, future presentations. Take care. Thank you so much for having us. Yes, thank you. You guys have a wonderful thank you, day. Diane.